4. Warfare on Favorable Ground Che Guevara Addressing the United Nations in New York City As we have already said, guerrilla fighting will not always take place in country most favorable to the employment of its tactics, but when it does, that is, when the guerrilla band is located in zones difficult to reach, either because of dense forests, steep mountains, impassable deserts, or marshes, the general tactics, based on the fundamental postulates of guerrilla warfare, must always be the same. An important point to consider is the moment for making contact with the enemy. If the zone is so thick, so difficult, that an organized army can never reach it, the guerrilla band should advance to the regions where the army can arrive and where there will be a possibility of combat. As soon as the survival of the guerrilla band has been assured, it should fight. It must constantly go out from its refuge to fight. Its mobility does not have to be as great as in those cases where the ground is unfavorable. It must adjust itself to the capabilities of the enemy, but it is not necessary to be able to move as quickly as in places where the enemy can concentrate a large number of men in a few minutes. Neither is the nocturnal character of this warfare so important. It will be possible in many cases to carry out daytime operations, especially mobilizations by day, though subjected to enemy observation by land and air. It is also possible to persist in a military action for a much longer time, above all in the mountains. It is possible to undertake battles of long duration with very few men, and it is very probable that the arrival of enemy reinforcements at the scene of the fight can be prevented. A close watch over the points of access is, however, an axiom never to be forgotten by the guerrilla fighter. His aggressiveness, on account of the difficulties that the enemy faces in bringing up reinforcements, can be greater. He can approach the enemy more closely, fight much more directly, more frontally, and for a longer time, though these rules may be qualified by various circumstances such, for example, as the amount of ammunition. Fighting on favorable ground, and particularly in the mountains, presents many advantages but also the inconvenience that it is difficult to capture in a single operation a considerable quantity of arms and ammunition, owing to the precautions that the enemy takes in these regions. The guerrilla soldier must never forget the fact that it is the enemy that must serve as his source of supply of ammunition and arms. But much more rapidly than in unfavorable ground, the guerrilla band will here be able to dig in, that is, to form a base capable of engaging in a war of positions, where small industries may be installed as they are needed, as well as hospitals, centers for education and training, storage facilities, organs of propaganda, etc., adequately protected from aviation or from long-range artillery. The guerrilla band in these conditions can number many more personnel. There will be non-combatants and perhaps even a system of training in the use of the arms that eventually are to fall into the power of the guerrilla army. The number of men the guerrilla's band can have is a matter of extremely flexible calculation adapted to the territory, to the means available of acquiring supplies, to the mass flights of oppressed people from other zones, to the arms available, to the necessities of organization. But in any case, it is much more practicable to establish a base and expand with the support of new combatant elements. The radius of action of a guerrilla band of this type can be as wide as conditions or the operations of other bands in adjacent territory permit. The range will be limited by the time that it takes to arrive at a zone of security from the zone of operation. Assuming that marches must be made at night, it will not be possible to operate more than five or six hours away from a point of maximum security. Small guerrilla bands that work constantly at weakening a territory can go farther away from the zone of security. The arms preferable for this type of warfare are long-range weapons requiring small expenditure of bullets supported by a group of automatic or semi-automatic arms of the rifles and machine guns that exist in the markets of the United States. One of the best is the M1 rifle, called the Garand. However, only people with some experience should use this since it has the disadvantage of expending too much ammunition. Medium heavy arms, such as tripod machine guns, can be used on favorable ground, affording a greater margin of security for the weapon and its personnel, but they ought always to be a means of repelling an enemy and not for attack. An ideal composition for a guerrilla band of 25 men would be 10 to 15 single shot rifles and about 10 automatic arms between garands and hand machine guns, including light and easily portable automatic arms 
such as the Browning or the more modern Belgian FAL or M14 automatic rifles. Among the hand machine guns, the best are those of 9mm, which permit a larger transport of ammunition. The simpler its construction, the better, because this increases the case of switching parts. All this must be adjusted to the armament that the enemy uses, since the ammunition that he employs is what we're going to use when his arms fall into our hands. It is practically impossible for heavy arms to be used. Aircraft cannot see anything and cease to operate. Tanks and cannons cannot do much owing to the difficulties of advancing in these zones. A very important consideration is supply. In general, the zones of difficult access for this very reason present special problems since there are few peasants and therefore animal and food supplies are scarce. It is necessary to maintain stable lines of communication in order to be able always to count on a minimum of food stockpiled in the event of any disagreeable development. In this kind of zone of operations, the possibilities of sabotage on a large scale are generally not present, with the inaccessibility goes a lack of constructions, telephone lines, aqueducts, etc. that could be damaged by direct action. For supply purposes, it is important to have animals, among which the mule is the best in rough country. Adequate pasturage permitting good nutrition is essential. The mule can pass through extremely hilly country, impossible for other animals. In the most difficult situations, it is necessary to resort to transport by men. Each individual can carry 25 kilograms for many hours daily and for many days. The lines of communication with the exterior should include a series of intermediate points manned by people of complete reliability, where products can be stored and where contacts can go to hide themselves at critical times. Internal lines of communication can also be created. Their extension will be determined by the stage of development reached by the guerrilla band. In some zones of operations in the recent Cuban War, Telephone lines of many kilometers of length were established, roads were built, and a messenger service maintained sufficient to cover all zones in a minimum of time. There are also other possible means of communication, not used in the Cuban War, but perfectly applicable, such as smoke signals, signals with sunshine reflected by mirrors, and carrier pigeons. The vital necessities of the guerrillas are to maintain their arms in good condition, to capture ammunition, and, above everything else, to have adequate shoes. The first manufacturing efforts should therefore be directed towards these objectives. Shoe factories can initially be cobbler installations that replace half soles on old shoes, expanding afterwards into a series of organized factories with a good average daily production of shoes. The manufacture of powder is fairly simple and much can be accomplished by having a small laboratory and bringing in the necessary materials from outside. Mined areas constitute a grave danger for the enemy. Large areas can be mined for simultaneous explosion, destroying up to hundreds of men.